Holtz. I've been uh, a founding member of Jetscape and uh, participating in most of these Zoom sessions. They've uh, just been amazing. So without any further uh, ado, I'm just going to say, uh, so today's topic, we're, we're in sort of the last couple of days. Uh, and so we're now covering the uh, Bayesian statistics for jet energy loss measurements. And our speaker today is, is Yi Chen. And uh, you, you should have, I guess, already, uh, there, there's, there's two, let's, one more thing. So there's two sessions. There's a lecture that will last a, a, about an hour and then a short session or a longer session for hands-on, uh, which involves Docker and Jupyter Notebook. So uh, you should already be somewhat familiar with those instructions. La last question, I think everyone may know this by now, or last point is that, uh, if you have questions, please direct them to the Slack channel uh, called Bayesian Chen, and uh, I and others will be monitoring that channel, and, and that's the most efficient way for us to get your questions uh, to Yi so he can answer them, she can answer them. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Yi. Okay, so hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of the Bayesian analysis. So uh, let's start with the lecture part. Okay, so so first of all, as a reminder, as Luke Rong has uh, said, uh, the main Slack channel will be this. It's also shown on the screen below me. And the best place to ask questions is there because even if Zoom has ended, we can still see the, see the questions being posted there and answered. And if you see a problem that you are also having uh, that's posted by other people, please press the thumbs up on that question so that we know that a lot of people have the same problem and we can address it uh, first. Okay, so here is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So first, uh, what is the problem we want to solve? And then uh, I'll cover what are the likelihood function and the posterior probability function in Bayesian formalism. And then what once we have the function, what can we do with it? And then uh, how can we obtain the function in the first place? And that will be the lecture part for today. And then there will be a hands-on session to go through all of these. And because there, are, there were already two days of patient analysis uh, before me, a lot of these topics are covered uh, in different amounts of detail. So my first goal today will be to give uh, the big picture with the statistical analysis, right? kind of like uh, stringing everything together. And then we will practice using the Jetscape statistical analysis package afterwards. Okay, let's start with the goal very broadly. So suppose we have some model uh, with some set of parameters that's shown on the box on the left. Uh, once we have these, then we can make predictions for new experimental data. And this essentially is um, what is the, covered by the first half of the school. For example, how to run Jetscape, how to make observables out of it, and so on and so forth. However, if uh, you just made a new model yourself and there are a few free parameters that's not clear what to set to, then this prediction part won't work out of the box in the beginning. Then we need the, the other half of the picture, which is to use the existing experimental data and trying to learn what parameters are the best uh, to use for any given model. Okay, so basically the, this is what we're trying to cover and it, it's the second part here. Okay, so let me start with the, the most central piece of, ev of everything here, which is the likelihood function. This is really the, the most central thing that's in this analysis. So to begin with, uh, what is the likelihood function? So the likelihood function is basically how likely a set of parameters is compared to other parameter values given some observed data. 
So it's usually written as the curly L. Uh, so throughout this talk, I will use the notation of the first uh, argument before the the vertical line is the what the fun this function is a function of, and what comes after is what is conditioning of. Um, so in this case, the likelihood is a function of the parameters of interest given some observed data from experiments. Okay, so let's start with a very simple example uh, for a counting experiment. So suppose we count number of events and the data says we have three counts. Then the likelihood will be written something like this uh, as a function of theta given that x equals three. So in this case, uh, the likelihood function can look, look like this on the left. So it's a function of theta and the y-axis indicates how likely a given theta value is. So here in this case, the most likely true count is three, uh, theta is three and 5.5 is quote unquote half as likely, and 8.5 is like 10% as likely, and so on and so forth. So in this uh, example, if the expected count is theta, then we can uh, write the probability of observing a count of x in data as suppose on distribution. Uh, this I think everybody knows, which is a function of the observed data given fixed data uh, parameter of interest. And the likelihood function in this case will be written, defined as with the exact same function of form, but uh, they are completely different objects in that this is a function of the parameter of interest given some fixed data. So even though they look similar, they are completely different. And there are a few more examples here. So for example, on the left is the theory parameters and on the right is the observed data, just to give a, a better picture of what these are. So for example, we have the, if we flip coins, there's a probability of head for each flip. That's the quote unquote theory parameter here. And on the right is the observed data, which is the heads or tail sequence of a coin flip. So the likelihood in this case would be that if we see some sequence here, what is the probability to look like of, of this head? And this, the probability density function would be that if we have a fixed probability of head per flip, what would be the expected outcome of the, of the coin flow flipping? Okay. There are also a few other examples, for example, cross-section number events, uh, counts in water tank and something relevant to us, energy loss parameter for the patterns in the QGP and what we observe is the RA. So one function that goes from one to other and the other one goes the other direction. Okay, now let's come to the division formalism. So how should we connect the two things conceptually? Uh, one is a function of parameter of interest, and another one is a function of data, or observed data. And one of the way that we can think about this is to go through the Bayes theorem uh, with an object called the posterior probability function, which is the probability density function of the parameter of interest given some data. So it's, it gives very similar uh, information as the, the actual likelihood function. And they are a little bit different, so I won't go over the difference here, but for our purpose, they give a very similar information. Okay, so how how does the division the uh, theorem goes? So uh, it all starts with the, the probability equality here. So a joint probability a distribution of two uh, variables can be written as the conditional probability of one variable times the probability distribution of the other variable. And 
uh, once we have this probability equality, we can then write the quote unquote right. The probability of x and theta can be written in two ways. And then we divide the, the probability of theta to, to, form, uh, to become this form, which is the base theorem. Okay. And then let's look at each term uh, more closely. So on the left hand side here, this is the posterior probability. Uh, this is the, the thing we are, we are after. Basically the probability distribution of the theory parameters given some data. On the right here, we have three terms. This term is the PDF of observing some data given fixed uh, prime, uh, theory parameter. So that will be the, the Poisson in the previous example. We also have two extra terms, which is one is the P of data. And this is the basically the prior knowledge of how likely a given parameter is true. So even before doing experiments, we might have some understanding of how things should look like. For example, the, some cross-section should not be infinite so, and so on and so forth. And that knowledge will be encoded in this prior field. There is also this term here in the denominator, uh, which is a kind of strange term. It's basically a probability of observing some data, generally speaking. Uh, however, uh, so this term is a bit weird to calculate, but usually in practical cases, uh, we would first do the experiment, we observe some x, and then we try to learn something from the experimental data. So in that case, x is a constant, which means that p of x is a constant. So we can remove that and replace the equal sign with the proportional to sign. And this will be the, the main uh, equation that we will be working with. So we, we don't have to worry about calculating this exactly. And we can just use proportionality to the rest. Okay, and let me tell, uh, talk a little bit more about the prior knowledge. So the Bayesian formalism always involves a prior uh, P of theta, which encodes our prior knowledge of how this data distributes. So it's both a blessing and a curse, if you think more about it. Uh, it's a blessing because it's, it's, a, it's a, a way that we can insert what we know before into the, the inference. And it's a curse because our outcome will always be biased by what we know before because we always have to put something there. And one popular choice of this is just make it uniform for so p theta equals to one. And this is usually called the uniform prior. It gives us back the, the most simplest case. However, even if we set it to flat, it doesn't mean unbiased. Uh, because there, you can easily imagine that theta is not the right parameter to look at, and it's actually theta squared. And then in that case, we should use p of theta squared equal to one, if we want to use uniform prior, or even log theta equal to one, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then uh, let's do a very small Bayesian analysis uh, exercise, uh, which goes as follows. So the setup of the question is like, so suppose you are sitting in your room and you look out the window and there's a small patch of ground. And if it's raining, the, the ground is wet 100% of the time. And if it doesn't rain, it could be that somebody is watering a flower and the ground is wet 10% of the time, okay? Now the forecast says uh, there's a 65% of chance of rain right now. Now, given that we see the ground is wet, uh, what is the probability that it is actually raining? Okay, so I'll wait a couple of minutes for people to try this out. Uh, this is very simple. So please press yes uh, if you get it and pre press no if you're not sure where, where to start. 
uh, Yi, this is Ron. So just to clarify, so when you ask people whether they get it, you mean that they understand what goes into each of the uh, um, each of the parts of the equation? Yeah, well, th this one is simple enough that if you know what goes into the equation, you can just try to get the answer, actually. Okay. But yeah, if you if you know how, how to get it, how to calculate it, best yes. Okay, uh, I see 31 yes and one no. So I, uh, let, let's move on. Okay, so the way to do this is on the next page. Uh, so we can write it in terms of the, 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 the functions that we, we used before. So the first line translate to probability of red given that it's raining is 100%. The probability of ground is wet given that the, it's not raining is 10%. The prior knowledge says 65%. So the probability of it's raining given that the ground is wet is proportional to uh, the probability of ground is wet given as raining times the prior knowledge which is 0.65. And then we can do the same thing for the case where it's no, not raining and it's 0 0.035. So the prob actual probability will be 94.9% in this case. Okay, now what if the forecast says it's only 5% of chance of raining? Then you see the same thing. And in this case, well, it's the same formula, we'll just plug the numbers. And it turns out to be 34.5% in this case. So this demonstrates uh, what uh, we've been talking about before, namely that our view of what is happening is really affected by our prior knowledge. And there is also no quote unquote unbiased probability of rain. Like what percentage will you say it's unbiased? And there are some pointers for further readings if you want to read more about these, and I won't go into those. So another way to think about the base formalism is uh, to refine our knowledge about the problem. So what I mean is that if you look at this formula here, this is what we know before, before doing the experiment. And this is what we know afterwards, after we do the experiment. <clears throat> okay. And however, th this is also not complete out of the blue because uh, we always have uh, our past knowledge of how physics works, for example. So this actually, everything is conditioning on our past knowledge. So the, the prior that we use in one, uh, one problem is actually can be thought as the posterior of everything that we learned before. So there, uh, the relationship between prior and posterior is actually relative. So whenever we have new data, we update our, our understanding of how things to distribute and we get a better estimate. Okay, so I'll stop here for the, the basic Bayesian part and I'll do a little recap. So the likelihood function, uh, likelihood of theta given some data, gives us the relative degree of likelihood as a function of theta given the observed data. And uh, in the Bayesian formalism, we can examine the object called the posterior function which gets very similar information. 
And this can be written in terms of the probability distribution function, which is the probability of observing data given some fixed theory parameters. And also with a prior term that encodes our prior knowledge. And there are ways to reduce the bias, but there's no really universally unbiased choice for, for this part. Okay, uh, let's stop here for a little bit and see if we have questions on Slack. Okay, the next part will be, what can we do with the function once we get it? So the simplest thing, uh, the most, most of the time what we do is actually to describe the function. What I mean by this is that, so we have this posterior function constructed. We try to say something about it. For example, the mean, RMS, or what's the most probable point, and so on and so forth. So an example here is, uh, I'm using the counting experiment uh, example again. This time, x was 20, and the likelihood of factors. So then we can report that for this likelihood function, the most probable value is 20, the mean is about 21, the RM is 4.57, and there's also a skewness, it's not symmetric, it's 0.41, and so on, so forth. And uh, this leads us to a very important point here, actually. So the uncertainty is also a description of the function. So the, the big take home, take home message uh, from this session and is that uh, in experimental physics, everything is always a distribution, the likelihood or posterior function. And the numbers we quote are actually just descriptions that char characterize the underlying function. So uh, even if you forget everything else I said, uh, this is the thing that I, I would like everyone to, to remember. So uh, as an example, when we say, uh, some experiment say that uh, we measure something to be 25 plus minus five, uh, what we're actually doing is describing the underlying likelihood function. So for example, it could mean that, uh, for example, most probable value is 25 and the uh, 28% most likely interval is 20 to 30. It could also mean that a range 20 to 30 has likelihood value above some threshold. Or it could also mean that the RMS of distribution is five and so on. Okay, so now let's uh, have a, a short quiz. So here is a mass distribution of the four lepton where you can see there's a Higgs both peaks, peaks here, which looks very nice. Now the question here is that the Y range here, is that a theory parameter of some, some parameter or is it the data? Uh, please press yes or no. Okay, um, I see most people answered no. So actually, uh, the way I would in interpret this is that it's actually uh, more the parameter. So uh, for, for each bin here, well, what we measure is that we see certain number of counts in that mass interval. So for example, it's eight counts here in that mass interval. And then from this eight, we can write out the likelihood function of what the true uh, count of this in this thing should be. And then we try to describe that likelihood function by quoting the uncertainty. So this range here from five to 12 is, is not what we, we, not that we observe five to 12, it's actually that 
based on what we see in data, we think that the most likely interval of the true count uh, here is in the in here. So I, I hope I make this clear. So the data itself uh, does not really have uncertainty if you don't have the systematic uncertainty. Uh, it's just how many you have. And it is, it is when we try to say something about the true uh, mean uh, number of counts in that bin, then we have the uncertainty. Okay, uh, let's move on. Okay, so rather than describing it, uh, what else can we do? <clears throat> so if we are lucky enough to write down the analytical form of the function, then things are easy. Then we can go crazy with it. We can derive many things. How about what if we have a large number of parameters or if the function evaluation is slow? In this case, uh, we can build the function numerically. And uh, I'll give an example from the Higgs analysis. So for example, if you want to measure the Higgs spin CP property, then we have a lot of parameters to, to go in. We have the mass, the, sh the width, and all the anomalous coplings that we want to get to. And there is a CMS uh, has a MD method in full lepton analysis. So in this method, uh, in this analysis, we have four leptons, each have three momentum. So we have 12 observables. And we have more than 10 parameters in here. And th this analysis, what uh, it does is that it tries to write down the full likelihood of these 12 dimensions. And what this means is that for each point in the likelihood, we have to do a 12 dimensional integral. And we have to evaluate a few 12 by 12 Jacobians for parameter change and so on, because the integral is not in that frame. And in the end, it turned end up to be about one second per evaluation. Now it doesn't seem that bad because it's one second. Uh, however, uh, if you want to fit for this thing, uh, the fit can easily take 100 or 1,000 steps. And then you want to derive the uncertainty from this, then it be quickly becomes uh, computationally very expensive. And there are many ways we can go for this. And one potential way uh, that we adapt in the statistical analysis here in Jetscape is we create a separate samples that distributes according to the posterior function that we have. So in other words, uh, uh, on the left-hand side here, we see that there's this, this function, uh, the likelihood function. And what we do is that we create a large set of numbers. So for example, first few are here and so on and so forth, like a million numbers. And if we take these numbers and plot a histogram, it gives us back the function. So if we are able to do this, then we can just analyze the samples because this is just a collection of numbers. Uh, we can derive things very easily and without having to worry about the caustic calculations on the left hand side, where each point can take uh, one second in the previous case or even longer in many other cases. Okay, and how do you do the sampling? Uh, the conceptually most simplest way is to basically shoot darts. So we have this uh, diagram, uh, this this curve. We print it out, put it on the, on the wall, and we shoot darts randomly. And then some will land outside the ring, uh, above the curve. Some will land uh, below the curve. And then we collect everything that's below the curve, and that's our sample. And I think it's easy to convince yourself that the samples will distribute according to the height of the curve. So this knife uh, one will work. However, it's not necessarily efficient because you see there are all the waste in calculation above here for the ones that's not accepted. 
So there are many, also many variants of this kind of dot shooting. Uh, for example, in, in Reiner's uh, lecture, he, he talked about some of them. Uh, for example, important, important sampling, where you exclude some parts of the phase space where you don't shoot things, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are many variants of this to improve the efficiency. And uh, in the statistical analysis here, we use what's called the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And it's, it sounds fancy, but it's basically, it's just another way to achieve the same thing. In other words, it's, uh, it can shoot darts more, much more smart, smarter than, than us. And uh, practically what it does is that it has a chain of samples. So it goes through the phase space with some special algorithm. So it picks a point in the parameter space. And then it try to go uh, follow some algorithm to go pick out the next point. And then from the next point, it pick out the even next one and so on and so forth. And it's emphatically uh, this set of samples will approach the desired distribution that we want. And for a bit, a bit, a bit of jargon, we call this collection of, of samples a chain. And it's basically just a chain of samples. Okay, and um, to make things more concrete, I will talk a bit about the so-called metropolis algorithm, which is uh, one of the, uh, which is a, a simple version of it. <clears throat> so the, the algorithm itself is very simple. So for example, you have already a chain of uh, samples and the last one is here, theta i. Then for each step, you pick a proposed location to move to randomly. So this is proposed, we propose to go here. And then we evaluate the likelihood of the original point and the proposed point. And it goes as follows. If the likelihood is, if it's more likely at the proposed point, we, we go there. If the likelihood of the proposed point is lower than where we you are right now, we throw a dice to de determine if we go or not. And that's it, basically. So this is uh, the the gist of the algorithm. And even though it's, it's very simple, uh, it's, it, it can be proven that this will approach the, the desired uh, posterior distribution in the end. So this, and this version actually already works reasonably well already. And it's, yeah, it's, it's very simple and it, to me, it seems like it's black magic, but it's, yeah. So uh, one direct consequence of this is that if you look at the list of samples uh, and look at the neighbor points, uh, because the, the outcome of each step can be, you go to next step or you stay at the same place. So that means that if you are staying in a place where it's very likely, it's, possible that you will stay in the same uh, place for multiple samples. And therefore the samples are very correlated from one to, to the next, next one. And the other consequences uh, will lead to what we call the burn-in effect. So the MCMC will only approach the desired distribution as asymptotically, meaning that if we let it uh, uh, iterate and go for a very long time, eventually the samples will approach what we want. And this also means that the initial state, initial steps do not necessarily follow our desired distribution. So for example, if you, your posterior distribution is, has a two-peak structure, uh, initially if you, you will start from one of the peaks and you will stay there for a long time, and if you don't wait long enough for the chain to move to the next peak, then all your samples will be on one side and that is not what we want. Okay. 
So uh, a schematic view here is uh, plotted here. So y axis is the theta i, the sample location. X axis is the steps. So it goes step by step, you just plot it out. And what we will see is something like this. In the beginning, you will be somewhere far away and going randomly. But eventually, after some time, it will follow the, the true distribution around some value. Okay, so let me recap a little bit about this part of the lecture. So once we have built the posterior function, then we can proceed to analyze it. And what we can do is we can call numbers to describe the function. And let me repeat the, the important message here. The numbers we quote, in experimental physics at least, are descriptions of the likelihood of what we think the true value should look like. And in case the, the thing is not analytical, we can also create samples and analyze them statistically. To do this, we can throw darts or we can run MCMC and so on and so forth. There are many other choices as well. Okay, uh, let's pause a little bit and see if we have any questions, so outstanding questions on Slack. So Yi, there was one uh, question from Dan that I think probability density function. And there's, there's, a, there's a nice reply uh, from Isaac on Stack Exchange that explains the difference, but I think, uh, I think it would also be helpful for you to address it. Yes, so uh, the short answer is no, not always. So as you know, the, the function basically is just a mapping. You have some x, you map it into y. And the likelihood function itself is just a mapping of how likely each parameter is. So talking about, uh, so it's not the probability density function, uh, not necessarily. And that's actually the main difference between the likelihood and the posterior probability. Because the posterior probability function is a probability density function. And then it makes sense to talk about the like sampling from it and doing things that it's cool, which in likelihood, it's, it's a great idea. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, I will move on. Okay, let's move on for now. We can always come back. Okay. Now the next question is, how do you build the posterior function? Let's go back to the simplest case, which is the counting experiment. So I, I like to start with simple things myself because all the fancy stuff are usually just more fancy way to do the same thing, conceptually. So in counting experiments, uh, the, the probability density function of observing some data given mean of theta is equal to the Poisson distribution. Which means that in this case, we can write down the, the posterior function analytically in a very straightforward way. And then we just analyze the function. So one example is quote unquote uh, uncertainty uh, with x equal to 40. So for the sake of this uh, exercise, let's define the quote unquote uncertainty to be the most likely region of theta that encloses 68.27% of the area of the curve. So if the curve is uh, Gaussian, then this, this range will be one sigma range. That's where this number comes from. So under this definition, uh, we can first write down the analytical form of this, uh, of this posterior density function. And we'll do some math and we conclude that this range is 33, uh, well, 34 to 46.7. Okay, and then now let's do a small exercise. 
So under this prescription, uh, what is the going call uncertainty if we don't observe anything? And please press yes if you get it. At least you know how to how to do it. And no if you're not sure. more for more people to answer before we move to the next one. Okay, I see it's, it's kind of split between yes and no. Okay, so let, let's move on. So uh, the way to do it is we take the prescription recurring. So the posterior function given that x equals zero can be written as this. This is just uh, the base zero. And we can plug it in and ignore this term, and it's proportional to this. Give it the, if we set the prior to be one. You can also set it to different things, you'll get different answer. And let's plug in x equals zero, it's just b to the net minus c. So this is how the posterior look like for flat tire. And this is how it look like uh, on the curve. And the prescription says that we want the area that's most likely area that includes 68.27%, uh, which is this, this thing. And we have solved it. And the answer, I think it's 1.12 or something. So under this prescription, we can set the uncertainty on zero counts of data to be 0 to 1.12 or so. Okay, so let's move on to the more uh, complicated case. So what we can do if the likelihood on one point takes weeks or even months to calculate on a computing cluster, it can happen. For example, uh, if you want to run hydro and drift state, then you will run like 10,000 events at least or even more. And this takes a lot of time. And then you analyze those data and then in the end, for all those, you get one point on the likelihood function. So there are some applications that things are very complicated in the cases. And in this case, the MCMC will not work well. So if you remember, uh, MCMC works by walking through the first case. And for each step, we need one evaluation of the likelihood. At least. And so if things take a month and you want 10,000 samples uh, and you start now, then maybe by the time you retire, you can, so you can get something. So it's definitely not feasible to do. So what is done here in the statistical analysis in JetScape is that uh, we pick nicely spaced points uh, in the first place, which we call the design points. We evaluate the likelihood on those and we interpret. So if the points are picked well, 
And for example, if you have five enough points, then an interpolate function should approach the likelihood for the posterior function that we're trying to study. And you can do this in many ways. You can do a grid, uh, or for example, uh, you can get a box of small metal balls, put some charge on it, put it in, uh, in an empty box, and they will repel each other. And once they settle, you use those points as the design points, for example, and so on and so forth. And there's an algorithm called uh, the Latin hypercube algorithm, uh, which is also used yesterday. It's basically just a, a more fancy algorithm that does this sampling better than uh, other, a lot of other algorithms. And I will not go into how this works here. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you're welcome to look further into it. To it. So now, how should we interpret it? The easiest case is we can interpret it with a straight line or we can use a spline. And this works more or less fine for one dimensional uh, things. So if you have just have one parameter, then you can do this. And the drawback for this is that the generalization to more dimensions is highly non straightforward. So, especially if your points are not on the grid. And if you look close enough, it's also not that ideal because if you just connect things with a straight line, there will be kinks. And this may or may not cause a problem uh, in the analysis afterwards. Another option is to fit a function. So if you have a very well modified weighted functional form, and then you can fit uh, this function. Uh, you can evaluate a few likelihoods, determine the parameters on the part of this function, and use this function as your likelihood function. And this is this was actually done in the Higgs example that I showed before. So in that case, we were able to track down a, a good function to use and use that. However, generally, uh, uh, we will not have a, a good function of point to use. And therefore, if you pursue with, with this option, the choice of function is just very, very, very important. And it's very easy to lead to biases with this, this mechanism. Right? One can also think about something like closest neighbor average. So for each point, uh, you look close by uh, where the, the close design points and use the distance to those as the inverse distance or you know, things like that to weight and average things. The advantage here is that it's easily generalized to higher dimensions. It doesn't matter what the dimension is. However, it's um, uh, it has to be handled with care uh, because if you are not choosing this weighting carefully, then it will smooth the likely function. And it may not be ideal for the question that we're trying to solve. Uh, which brings us to the next level of quantification, which is the Gaussian process emulator, which was also talked about in the previous few days. So this basically interpolates points without needing to assume a global function of form. And this can also easily be adapted to higher dimensions. And another uh, good thing about this is that it also gives interpolation. So if you say that as they can predict, uh, interpolate what the value for six here, uh, theta equals six, six here, it gives you the, the y value, but also a range that the uncertainty that it thinks based on this. And that can be useful uh, down the road to, to make things more robust. Okay, so let's have a small recap of building the likelihoods. And there are many, many ways we can build a function. And if we are extremely lucky, which almost never happens in real life, uh, we have can have analytical functions for the likelihood or the posterior. And when it becomes more complicated, uh, some approximations have to be made. 
And for example, in the case of computing intensive calculation, you can pick points and interpolate. And the uh, Gaussian process emulator is one of the good ways to do it, uh, which is uh, why we use it in the statistical analysis in this case. Okay, let's pause a little bit and see if we have any questions. So Yi, one uh, question that came in during your Poisson example is that it looks like you're assuming a uniform prior in that example? Yes, in that example, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so let's move on for now. Uh, now that we have examined all the, the separate pieces about the likelihood function or the posterior function, uh, it's time to put it all together and see how different parts fit together in the statistical analysis framework. So the analysis workflow uh, can be shown here. There are a lot of boxes here. And it's basically the same workflow that, that was done yesterday by Wei Yang. Uh, it's just <coughs> putting in boxes here. So first we pick the design points uh, in the parameter space, and we cal calculate model predictions uh, for those design points. And then we use Gaussian process emulator to interpolate the all phase space. Oops. And on the other hand, we prepare data from experiments and the combination of these, we can write on the posterior function. And for the posterior function, we feed it into MCMC, which gives us the samples. Then we can run it. Okay, so it looks very complicated, uh, doing like this, so with so many boxes. But if we write on what each box is supposed to do, then it becomes clear. So the, the main, uh, thing for the upper half is to build a posterior function, this is P of theta given of x. To do this, we need the x, and we need the, the P of x given theta for all points. To get this, uh, we do it on the number of points and then interpolate. And then MCMC is just a transformer to give you the samples. Okay, I hope this is more clear what each box is supposed to do. And for Jetscape, there is a statistical analysis package that you can use that package up a lot of the steps and the GitHub, GitHub location is there. It also evolves through many, many collaborators. So it's Python based and it's quite simple to use. And uh, one advantage of this package is that uh, the input format is standardized, which I will cover in a few slides. So suppose you are trying to learn something, you have to go model, you will learn the parameters from one set of data, and your colleague sitting next to you also want to use the same data to learn the parameters for this model, then you can share the, the files. And this is uh, also more, uh, it's less error prone by doing everything by hand because it's, there's a set of files and then you can always come back and see if there's anything wrong with the file. So doing everything by hand is good if you are trying to learn things. Uh, eventually, once you learn, once you know it, well, how everything is put together, then there's also a merit to use the, the packages. So more practically, uh, if we go back to the to a diagram, the statistical, statistical analysis package basically package up all these things in the bottom. And whatever is outside the box, we have to prepare ourselves. So for data, it usually comes on experiments. Um, if you want to Propose a new analysis, it could take a while, but usually we take whatever is available and try to learn things from there. 
There's also the theoretical inputs, um, which can take a while to calculate things. And that's why we do all these things uh, that this slide before. And there's also cases where you set everything up, you do your analysis, and then you discover that the design points are not finite, that in the end, the result is not stable. In that case, we may need to go back, pick more design points, calculate more predictions, and then we run things. And the uh, good news is that uh, once you get the inputs down, this part is relatively fast. So to get, get some answer is usually like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or maybe one, a couple hours with the computer server. So we, we can play with these settings very easily. Okay, uh, let's pause here to see if we have any questions. Oh, I see there's a follow up. So uh, actually, I meant the error when we include experimental data in the flow chart. Oh, okay. So in here, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, so you, you would, in the prepared data step, you will also put in the error and that uncertainty will be used to construct the procedure function. And the Sir, uh, what I meant was uh, when when we get the experimental data mm -hmm. and we are generating these samples, can we have a bound on uh, how much error are we producing from uh, in, in the final steps? How much sure we can be about the sampling process and uh, compared because we are using both model predictions and experimental data. So is there a method to calculate how much errors we will be producing uh, like in this samples and uh, while, while calculating the posterior function? Yeah, uh, so in general, this it's not that easy to disentangle, but in this, uh, this case, you can get an idea. So you can run the whole thing uh, with all the errors. And then, uh, Independently, you run the whole thing again, turning off the experimental error and see how much the, uh, the result differs. And this will give you an idea of how much that matters, for example. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, the next is hands-on session. So shall we take a five minute break here? So we will do uh, a simple hands-on session. And so for today, we will try to learn uh, the parameters of a simple function. And the general procedure is very similar to the past two days. And the main difference is that uh, for today, the primary goal would be to understand how to use the step package instead of uh, doing all, all the different steps uh, by hand. 